So we've just opened up and everyone should be joining us. So welcome today to the Safe Food webinar. My own name is Tracy Thompson. I'm joined by my colleague James McIntosh and our guest presenter today, Hazel Gowland. Um, I'll go through some housekeeping briefly while people are still joining us. Uh, all attendee microphones and cameras are turned off. Um, Hazel will present her presentation to everyone and during the course of the presentation, please feel free to submit your questions through the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Hazel will get to those when she has completed her presentation and we begin the Q&A session. Um, that is about it. Uh, James will go through what you can do to keep in touch with Hazel and I'll hand it over to James. So without any further ado, Thanks, Tracy, and uh, very good morning to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, today, today's webinar that focuses on an update on milk hypersensitivity. You know, you may very well ask, well, what do you mean by update? Well, milk hypersensitivity is really a very broad brush, and it includes not just milk allergy, but a whole range of, of intolerances to milk. <clears throat> and as with other food allergies and intolerances, managing the risk is really about avoiding uh, the food that makes you sick, in this case, milk and milk products. Milk hypersensitivity affects quite a lot of people on the island of Ireland, not just in infancy. Lactose intolerance, for instance, is estimated to affect around 5% of the population. It's also quite topical at the moment, uh, with some discussion around things like tolerance levels for milk protein in uh, certain foods, like, for instance, vegan foods, etc. But here to discuss all of this and more is Dr. Hazel Goland. Hazel is an expert patient advocate, researcher and trainer and a visiting fellow at the University of Southampton School of Medicine. She was involved in shaping the UK anaphylaxis campaign from 1994 and established Allergy Action, which is a research and training consultancy in the year 2000. In 2018, she was awarded a PhD for a thesis that focused on innovation in advocacy, research and training to support and protect those at risk. And indeed, she has used her training skills not just in Britain, but here on the island of Ireland as well, where she's been involved in a number of training programs over the years. She's a member of the Scientific Committee of the IFST and uh, the Food Special Interest Group of the Royal Society of Public Health. And she lectures on MSc allergy programs in Southampton University and Imperial College London and human nutrition programs at the University of Kingston. So Hazel, you're very welcome. Have I actually left anything out? <laughs> I don't think so, James. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, yes, well, there we are. There's an act to follow from James there. Um, an update on milk hypersensitivity. Um, some of the things that James just mentioned are on this list. Uh, basically, I train, I educate, I learn, I listen, and I try to improve the lives of people with different kinds of food hypersensitivity in particular. Um, if you've ever seen me present, you'll be familiar with this picture. This is me in the uh, week when I was about 14 months in the olden days. And that's when my father gave me a tiny bit of peanut butter and um, I blew up and they fetched the doctor and uh, the doctor gave me an injection, the swelling went down and my parents realized that they had a baby called Hazel who was allergic to nuts. So that's my background. And my work now falls into three headings. There's advocacy, working on behalf of allergic people, trying to influence policy, work with regulators, caterers at schools, etc. So anybody who has any uh, opportunity to improve the lives of people at risk, um, then research, starting with really simple going shopping, you know, what, are, what does it say on the packets? Um, what choices are there available for people with uh, food hypersensitivities? Um, a long-term research interest in fatal anaphylaxis, particularly when it regards food. Um, an interest, a research interest in regulation. Um, is the law working? Is it protecting people at risk? Uh, how is it being implemented? Um, and then clinical studies where I support clinicians and, um, and also the, the individuals participating. And then training, as James said, all sorts of different audiences, environmental health, trading standards, public analysts, um, clinicians, scientists, etc. Lots of different people will, will listen about uh, allergies. 
So understanding food avoidance, this is a slide that I use in all my training because it, from a food business point of view, um, people are telling you they can't have this, they can't have that, they don't want this. And you as a food business and your staff have to deal with this request and understand what it means. And of course, there are people who just don't want it, they don't like it, it's not gonna do them any harm, but they would prefer not to eat it. Then there are people who might be choosing food because they're doing some kind of a diet. They might be I don't know, pregnant, losing weight, gaining weight, um, avoiding certain things for the benefit of their general health. Then there are people who have intolerances um, where the mechanism is usually to do with um, some sort of gastrointestinal upset. The food doesn't go down nicely or it uh, doesn't go through nicely. Um, then there's, if you like, my kind of allergy there, you can see um, very red blotchy eyes and most allergic reactions to foods are mild and they don't get much worse than this, but in some cases obviously they do and you end up with the potential for um, anaphylaxis. Um, then we have celiac disease, which is in a category of its own, an autoimmune condition affecting the functioning of the gut. Uh, with short-term and long-term health implications. Um, kosher, and of course people leading a kosher lifestyle might be interested in the presence of milk in food because of their dietary rules. Um, halal, um, another religious diet, and then vegan and vegetarian. Now that simplifies it, but from a business point of view, you've got people requesting all these foods, and of course some of them have impact on today's presentation. So you've got uh, allergy, you've got religious diets, and you've got people who are following a vegan diet who would be wanting to avoid milk. Now, um, this is not my best top subject, but I have used the resource of the anaphylaxis campaign, Cow's Milk Allergy Fact Sheet, and I strongly recommend that if you want to understand this better, you do the same. There's a little picture in the corner of what it looks like. Um, but this is so that we have an understanding of what these conditions are. So immediate cow's milk allergy in infants and young children. So it's what they call an IgE mediated allergic response. That means that your immune system has encountered one or more proteins from milk in this case, in the past, set up antibodies to them. And those antibodies are then available in the body. And if you then have whatever milk protein it is again, whether it's from a cow or some other animal, um, the body will recognize them and that may trigger an allergic response. It may make symptoms happen. Um, a lot of these people might have a family history and this kind of allergy is more likely to last. Half of the children have outgrown it perhaps by age five, but it might last longer than that. Um, the symptoms can start within minutes and typically last, start within two hours at the latest. So it's an immediate uh, hypersensitivity. Um, these are the typical symptoms, skin flushing, rash, swelling, swollen lips, tummy pain, etc. Um, those are the symptoms that are fairly well managed, but if it gets any worse, you end up with potentially life-threatening symptoms, tongue swelling, hoarse voice, difficulty swallowing, breathing, wheeze, cough, and then of course faint, drowsy or dizzy, which are the classic symptoms of a severe allergic reaction. And of course that is then a medical emergency. Um, as for feeding, now um, there's breastfeeding, um, which um, obviously uh, can be done with a milk allergic child. Um, the types of formula that are available, there's the partially hydrolyzed formula, that's where the proteins have been bashed around a bit, but uh, they're still partially intact. Uh, the allergenicity is therefore reduced and some babies can cope with that. Or there's the extensively hydrolyzed formula where the proteins are broken down right down to amino acid level. All this processing takes time and costs money so that the extensively hydrolyzed formula is quite expensive and being able to access it and pay for it are challenges for many people. When it comes to having solid food, um, 
it may be possible to reintroduce or to, yeah to reintroduce the milk through the food um, so that there can be some tolerance brought in there and this is called um, a milk ladder so you start at the bottom where the proteins are well cooked in a malted milk biscuit i know it's not that legible but um, you can look it up the milk ladder um, and right to the top so you go through various stages where the milk is increasingly less um, processed and the proteins are less denatured to the top where you're back on normal milk again and that's the aim with a ladder then you have a different kind of milk allergy in infants and young children called delayed cow's milk allergy now this used to be called cow's milk protein intolerance but i think they're now calling it non-ig mediated allergic response once again, you might have a family history and it's usually outgrown quicker than the IgE mediated version. The symptoms are slower. You haven't got that sort of few minutes to two hours. It's much harder to diagnose because you haven't got the typical allergy test that you can do um, for IgE mediated. So the skin prick test and the blood test don't work. And really the only diagnostic tool you have is to not have it for two to four weeks and see what happens. Typically the symptoms are gastrointestinal, so you've got reflux, vomiting, colic, refusing feeds, and then you've just got a very, very upset baby with pain, possibly blood in the poo, possibly rash, and then a sort of snuffly breathing problem. Um, the feeding um, issues are fairly similar. Um, but once again, you might be able to use the milk ladder to reintroduce um, cow's milk to the diet. Now, this is a recent paper by Munblit et al. at uh, Imperial in London, and it is suggested in this paper that milk hypersensitivity is overdiagnosed in babies, and there's this rather helpful diagram. So if you talk to parents, the babies that they use that were examined in this uh, study. There were 650 babies in the EAT study control group. Now the EAT study was done um, in London by Michael Perkin and colleagues, uh, trying to introduce six uh, allergenic standard foods into the diet actively to try and induce tolerance so that the babies would be able to eat them. Whereas in other cases where they didn't have those foods, they might have developed an allergy. So they chose babies that were high risk for food allergy and they'd been breastfed for three months. The parents reported vomiting, colic and eczema as regular symptoms. And you can see those three symptoms on the uh, screen here. And you can see that milk allergy is suggested here. But also you can see these tiny little circles, um, milk allergy, really when you actually challenged those children and gave them cow's milk protein there were very few that really genuinely had cow's milk protein allergy when the gold standard test was done milk hypersensitivity is overdiagnosed it's suggested that this is this was the quote when working with infants and their mothers we need to be careful not to blindly diagnose every mewling and puking infant with cow's milk allergy because it probably isn't so mewling and puking infant is a quote from shakespeare and obviously lots of babies have those symptoms but not all babies have cow's milk allergy then there are other hypersensitivities um, and I'm just going to give you the big names, but you can read about them in the fact sheet if, you, um, if you're interested. So cow's milk induced pro proctocolitis, cow's milk protein induced enteropathy syndrome, is eosinophilic gastrointestinal disorder, which is called EGID, uh, food protein induced enterocolitis syndrome. Now that's called FPIES, and there is now a support group for people with FPIES. You can find it on Twitter. Um, and then there's lactose intolerance. Now, lactose intolerance is a very different condition altogether and um, definitely lasts throughout life. Um, in evolution, uh, we have needed some uh, lactase, which is an enzyme in our gut, to digest the milk sugars in our mother's milk. And many populations have lost the lactase over time and don't have any anymore. So if you keep consuming 
lactose, which is this milk sugar in, into, uh, well, as you get past weaning, then you need lactase to digest it. And if you don't have it, then you'll get upset tummy, etc. Now, it's not the same as a milk allergy at all. And there are people who can um, use this kind of product, a lacto-free milk, where the lactose has been processed or reduced and they can drink that safely but that is absolutely no good at all to anybody with a proper cow's milk allergy or even a protein intolerance. So we're talking about intervention in the diet to try and stop babies becoming allergic and there you are there's a baby delighted with what's happening at the minute. Uh, the study was based on um, uh, two studies actually, Leave and Eat. Uh, the LEAP study was learning early about peanut and the principle was that um, London doctors went to Israel, discovered there that there really isn't much peanut allergy, but what there is, is early consumption from three, four, five months of this peanut containing snack. So the babies um, are being actively given this regularly because it's part of their weaning cultural diet and they don't get a peanut allergy. On that basis, and thinking about other things to do with skin exposure, so if you have an eczematic baby with open skin, um, maybe the food is getting in from the home environment, but they're not actually being given any, and that gives a different allergic response. Then they tried it in the EAD study with six um, allergenic foods, starting with milk and then eggs, uh, peanuts, sesame, fish, and cereals containing gluten, uh, which was Weetabix in the end, I think that they had, and tried to introduce these foods to prevent the babies becoming allergic. And of course, that's a more complex experiment, uh, not as clear cut, but the principle was established. So babies who are likely to develop food allergy, which means that they've got a history, they've got uh, maybe dry skin eczema, um, family history. Exposure without eating the food, um, if, for example, via your skin can sensitize, but exposure by early consumption, regularly eating that food allergen, not just once, but regularly can protect. And that is the hypothesis that was just about proven in both of these um, pieces of work to the point where milk would have been introduced as um, a fromage fray fairly early in the in the diet. Then maybe the child has been sensitized and, it, and you want to try and do something about this and we've already talked about the milk ladder. So you start with supervised consumption of the food allergen where the food allergen is well broken down. So instead of milk being in that form, it's disguised and it comes in the form of a malted milk biscuit um, or if it's egg, you can disguise it by baking it well in a muffin, for example. And then gradually you give forms where it's increasingly intact. Now, it doesn't work for everybody. There are side effects. There's gastrointestine upset. And we need to really understand whether this lasts and what you have to do to make it last. So the people who um, didn't have the early dietary intervention maybe, or the people who haven't had immunotherapy might keep their allergies, might have them into, early, into older childhood and need to avoid the allergens. And we will be the people paying attention to notices like this. We will be the people trying to engage with staff in restaurants and cafes and online, etc. And it also depends what you're prepared to put up with. You can see here, there's a child with a swollen eye. Um, he's obviously absolutely fine. He's quite cheerful. Um, you'd be watching him to see what happened about that swollen eye, but he's obviously not upset and he's gonna probably just get through this and he'll maybe, maybe get some antihistamine, maybe not. Um, maybe a bit of a damp down with a cold flannel, but uh, there are lots and lots of little reactions like this that take place. Um, which are daily events for some families and rarely does it get worse than that. However, we do need to know what to avoid. We need to know where it's used. We need to read the labels. We need to talk to staff, get substitutes sometimes for things that um, we can't have and look stuff up online. And the worst case scenario is that you have some symptoms that you have to be ready to manage and there are thousands and thousands of families living in this way of life. 
So we need the information on the food. And of course, thankfully now throughout the EU and the UK, we've got um, the allergens highlighted in the ingredients list. This is a baguette, which is a hard thing to label, but you can see nice big print and the allergens are highlighted here. And then we're the people also who need to heed these notices saying, talk to me when you're ordering and tell me about your allergy and I'll tell you what's in which dishes. Um, we need the 14 allergens, we need full labelling on factory products. In catering, the least they have to do is make the 14 allergens information available for the ingredients. And everything has to be consistent. There's nothing to make you more nervous as an allergic consumer than when there's a discrepancy between the menu or the folder or the website or the thing that the, the member of staff has said, you need consistency. This is an allergy menu where each dish has got code for the different allergens and also for the may contains on it. Now, if you talk to people in the food industry, this is a huge pub chain and I can't remember what period this was over, but they had collected allergen complaints, allergens in inverted commas. Um, so what foods were people complaining about? Well, I've noted this one here, dairy, but also I've noted milk because you can see there that people use the word dairy and there's some confusion about what dairy actually means. Um, legally, if you've put milk from a mammal in food, you have to use the word milk. It can be from any mammal, it can be from a sheep or a goat or a horse, um, but you have to call it milk. The word dairy is really difficult to deal with because it's what customers say, but staff have to answer legally with the word milk because actually that's a dairy and we have to kind of keep grabbing the word back and meaning the place where milk products are supplied. There are people who think that everything that the milkman might bring is from is dairy. That includes eggs and orange juice and newspapers and whatever else that the milkman might bring. But we have to keep coming back to the four letter word, which is milk, because that is the legal word for labeling and for describing food. And it must come from a mammal. Um, I have kept a database of court cases. This is a, um, a piece of work which is currently being written up um, uh, from 2014 to 2020 at the end of January. And you can see here that the food involved where there were prosecutions, um, there's peanut, which is the big one, but milk is sort of equal second with egg. And that's good, really, that regulators are taking an interest in uh, finding out where milk is not, not labelled or, or where people have asked to have no milk and it's been present. Um, now, in England and Wales and Northern Ireland, uh, from October 2021, there's a change in the food labelling law. Um, essentially, the, there are three ways to to sell sandwiches. There's the packet from the factory, which you can see on the left hand side, and that has full ingredients and allergen labeling. There's the box with the sandwich that's been made to order by the uh, member of staff in the cafe or the takeaway. And that's been done at the request of the customer. So there's no need to label the ingredients on that, provided you can tell the customer uh, if they ask what's in it or provide them with a folder saying what's in it. But the sandwich at the front is the status called pre-packed for direct sale. Now that means we made it out the back this morning and we've put it in the chiller because we expect a busy lunch rush hour and we want to put things out there so people can just come in quickly and pick them up. And you can see it just says cheese and tomato and at the minute that's fine but after October 2021 in the places that I have mentioned and not in the Republic and not in Scotland yet, um, you will have to put the full ingredients and the 14 allergens on that packaging. And that is changing. And the Food Standards Agency has put out guidance to support that. So pre packed for direct sale is where it's been made out the back, wrapped up in some form of sealing packaging and put out for people to pick up. And that's where it's going to change. Now, <clears throat> We're talking about may contain here, and there are some principles. Um, 
generally speaking. So if you're making the brand leader, if you're making the main one of the market, then you might have a dedicated line. You're making so much of that product that you can do it night and day and you don't need to make anything else on that line. However, if you're making jar sauces like this, you might want to make different jar sauces on the same line. Because it's a wet product and because uh, you can do things through pipes, um, you can design the equipment and you can do what they call cleaning in place. So you can wash that whole lot of equipment all the way through um, with hot washing, with detergents, you can design the equipment so there's no nasty bends where stuff gets stuck. And you can essentially use that line for lots of different products. Now, you'd be able to uh, make a, a tomato sauce and then you could make one with perhaps a creamy sauce, a milk sauce, and then maybe something with fish or something with nuts. And they would all be cleaned in between and you would be sure by validation and verification that you hadn't got traces of that particular allergen left. So you might be able to not have to use the precautionary allergen labeling, what's called PAL, on that line because you've been able to clean it well. However, when it comes to chocolate, there are particular problems. I'm, I've chosen chocolate particularly for this reason. Cleaning with water in a, in a chocolate factory introduces microbiological risks, so you try not to do it. Um, therefore, the best way to clean is to push either fat or waste chocolate down the line, which will collect the lumps. Now, you can see there's a picture of a piece of chocolate there with a, with a bit of nut in it. Um, maybe not so much now that the older factories are not being used so much but but on, on old factories you'd have bits of stuff got stuck on a ledge and then if you then made a different version of the product they might drop off into that particular product so if you made a plain bar having made some hazelnut chocolate there was a risk um, similarly you might get peanuts or particularly wheat or milk in powder or liquid form in products that don't actually contain them as ingredients um, you can see here some chocolate production. It's pretty messy and as I say they, they don't really want to have to clean too often because it's a big job and uh, it shuts down the line quite a lot. But if you've got dark chocolate in a chocolate factory that otherwise processes milk, you're going to get milk even when you didn't want it in there. So trusting that chocolate doesn't have milk in is quite a, a challenge. Um, this is a, an image of the amounts of allergen. Can you see in the right hand corner there, that's a centimetre, that gives you an idea of scale. So this is the amounts of the different allergens that are what, what we call the thresholds. They're the amount that um, most people can have if they're allergic to it, but some people can't. The top row is called EDO5 and that is the amount of the different allergens that if you take a whole load of people who are allergic to them will not cause them any trouble. So 95% of people won't have any symptoms with that top row. The bottom row is EDO1 and that means that 99% sorry, 99 of the people allergic to that food won't have any trouble with them, won't have any what they call objective symptoms. So that gives you an idea of the amounts of food that people are talking about when they look at may contain. And then we've got free from foods. Now free from foods are usually made deliberately to exclude particularly milk and um, cereals containing gluten and prevent cross contamination. Now they're different from standard food because the ingredients are not allowed in the factory unless each batch has been tested. So it's called positive release where they let the different ingredients into the site only when they've been tested. And that of course is time consuming and expensive. And the alternative substitute foods, you know, if you're using potato flour, tapioca flour, for example, instead of wheat flour, they might be more expensive. So that's the free from market. There's, there are people who've got allergies and intolerances and then there's a bigger market of people who just don't want to eat whatever wheat or whatever lifestyle type. Um, then there are substitute products for example these are looky likey cheeses that are made from I think rice in this case so people want to have cheese they can't have milk so they uh, pay more money for um, these substitute products. 
have to be clear what they're actually free from. Now, if you go to a free from section in the supermarket, they might have a big sign like that, but it doesn't mean that every single item under that section is free from all those things. Um, this is a, a chocolate bar, and I believe that it was this chocolate bar that was consumed, was bought by a father for a son with a milk allergy, thinking that it was free from milk. And now that's really misleading because you can see it says coconut milk chocolate bar. So is it coconut milk or is it milk chocolate? You can understand how difficult it is to communicate what things actually don't have in, especially when they're branded and labeled. Must be very clear which things are in and which things are out because it, all free from things are not free from everything. And then we've got the whole current trend towards plant based. Um, alternatives. Now you can't call these milk as I said earlier because they don't come from a mammal and there are various wriggly ways of not calling them milk although people who've got them in their fridge I'm sure they will say oh that's the almond milk that's the rice milk but legally they can't be called milk because they didn't come from a mammal. You can see that lots of them different different sources of protein to make alternatives for milk. When you start using these in a coffee shop, you then have a new allergenic risk. And this is a coffee shop with a notice saying, because we're now using almond milk, um, we have to um, do cross-contamination controls. And you can't see the detail here, but um, the system is that um, the different colored cloths for wiping the frother between different uh, people's drinks, uh, to try and do some control of cross-contamination so that a person with who wants a milky drink doesn't get almond cross-contamination, for example. This is a new piece of work. It only came in last week. It's a Torfine in South Wales. Um, local authority went looking at drinks in vending machines. Uh, have they got the allergen information available in the vending machine or for the customers to see? Half of them did and, and half of them didn't. Um, some of them have got small text saying these products contain milk on all of them. Um, the issue, of course, is that if you wanted to buy a black tea or a black coffee and you had a milk hypersensitivity, uh, how likely would it be that you'd get some cow's milk in your drink? So they tested it by buying a milk containing drink and then buying a drink which didn't have milk in like black tea or black coffee. And five, one, one in five, two in 10 had cross contamination with milk in the black tea or the black coffee. And they also had allergen warning notices like this. So you can see that all the certain drinks contain milk, other drinks may contain traces, chocolate has milk and soya. So that's about as good labeling as you're gonna get on a vending machine, I think. And the soups contain various other allergens. But the issue of being able to uh, know what the allergens are before you make your mind up and be sure of what you're getting is a challenge on vending machines. Um, I've kept data about fatal anaphylaxis for the last 30 odd years. Um, if you look at which foods people seem to have been allergic to and we never know for sure, well we rarely know for sure, you can see that milk is quite a significant cause of um, fatal anaphylaxis compared with brown which is nuts and peanuts and the pinky color which was well, sorry brown which is peanut the pinky color which is nuts and peanuts and the purple which is tree nuts of course on the right hand side you've got the green column which means it looked like milk uh, it looked like food allergy it timed like food allergy but we don't know what the allergen was but milk fatal reactions to milk are significant and continue uh, this is looking at things the other way around. So from 2001 to 2020, and you can see uh, 2019, we had three that seemed to be cow's milk protein uh, reactions. Um, and in 2017, we had six out of 17 deaths. So milk protein is definitely a cause of fatal anaphylaxis in, these are not babies, these are not tiny children, these are young adults. Shahida Shahid was 18. She was a student. She knew she was allergic to milk. She asked for plain chicken and it turned out that the chicken was coated in buttermilk. That's a current uh, uh, a dish that people ask for. Um, but of course, it may have just been cooked on a grill, but it's been lying in a bed of milk all night. 
uh, she mentioned her allergy and she collapsed and died in Manchester. Uh, this is Owen Carey. He also had but buttermilk chicken. He and his family who were with him also asked to avoid milk. Um, this led to a preventing future deaths report. We need to make this known. Um, this is Chloe. Now she had um, milk in yogurt used to bind the meat in a donor kebab. So the meat that goes round and round is sort of glued together, reconstituted. And um, sometimes yogurt is used, sometimes soy is used. And she had no idea. And neither did the business that sold her the kebab. Um, this is Karen Shima. This is an exceptional case and has been written up in the uh, medical literature. Uh, another boy in school was joshing around at break and chucked a little tiny piece of cheese down the back of his t-shirt at 25 past 11 and he started to have some symptoms and he went to the medical room and he paced up and down scratching for 10 minutes and then he went into a major asthmatic attack and by 10 to 12 he was in cardiac arrest. The 25 minutes just having the cheese down the back of his t-shirt that is exceptional that is a really unusual situation and outcome this is uh, Ruben he had popcorn at the cinema um, he'd eaten the same popcorn before without a reaction but he also had a cow's milk allergy um, so Chloe was 15 Karen was 13 and Ruben was 14 and this is a little British boy who was on holiday in Italy um, and he, he had a known milk allergy. His parents asked to avoid milk. He had a pasta dish which contained milk. Now this is unusual because the Italian um, regulatory system has now given the boss of the restaurant a two year suspended jail sentence. It's the first case like this that I've heard of from abroad. Um, this was an issue with a little boy from uh, the UK who went to Blackpool. Um, he had a known milk allergy, went to Pizza Hut. Uh, the waiter talked to the family about the fact that he could offer them vegan cheese, which is a sort of reconstituted uh, product that you can put on pizzas with perhaps coconut, things like that in it. And that's what they asked for. Um, unfortunately, the waiter ordered the vegetarian cheese, which is different. Vegetarian cheese contains milk proteins. It just maybe doesn't have any rennet um uh, in its processing the waiter saw the reaction and tried to backtrack his order and pretend that he'd ordered vegan which he hadn't and of course this was all traceable on the computer system and it was the waiter that was fined and convict well convicted fined and ordered to pay compensation and the business itself could demonstrate that they had a system in place and that they had trained the waiter and it wasn't their fault that was section 14 of the Food Safety Act. Um, this is some work I've done with uh, Professor Julie Barnett and others um, at the University of Bath uh, for the Food Standards Agency. We did a lot of work looking at how people are coping before and after the food information regulation came in, particularly for eating out. And we went back and wrote an extra last paper on people avoiding milk because we recognise that avoiding milk is the hardest thing. So we wrote a special paper to bring this to people's attention. So people with milk um, hypersensitivity need visual indicators and clinicians can help by making sure that um, consumers, patients understand what they can and can't do to avoid accidental milk ingestion. Two more things, uh, juice bars. These are just tweets that I picked up. So we've got somebody who had juice from a juice bar that's obviously, they maybe haven't cleaned out the, um, um, a process, the what do you call them, the, um, um, the blender. Um, and the other one is a cocktail and people are not paying attention about what's in uh, cocktail ingredients. There are quite a lot of cocktail ingredients that do contain milk and this isn't always widely understood or recognized and of course businesses do have to keep the ingredients for a cocktail um, and the allergens available if somebody asks but people don't always think either of asking or of providing the information 
What about food allergens in non-food? So this is goat's milk moisturising lotion and this is goat's milk soap. Now the goat's milk soap was involved, uh, it was examined in Australia where it's quite commonly used and a woman who had goat's milk soap, had used goat's milk soap, found that she then had problems drinking goat's milk, which she had always done. So she'd been sensitised through her skin to be allergic to goat's milk because she'd used the soap. We don't know about sensitization um, and we don't also know too much about reactions but if you're just using the hand soap in somebody's bathroom somewhere you might not think it would have milk in it even you know it's labeled on the front fine but you might not realize and this is uh, ass's milk so soap made of ass's milk so cleopatra has got a lot to answer for there um, this is a reaction to milk protein in a tooth treatment in Australia. So there are uh, things with milk in turning up in places that we might not realise. Most important thing is to ask both sides. You ask if you've got somebody who's allergic and you ask if you are the allergic person or you're buying things on their behalf. Um, just a last reminder, this is a slide just to remind everybody that if we are dealing with anaphylaxis or a severe allergic reaction, symptoms can be unpredictable. They may change throughout life. What happened last time might not be what happens this time or what happens next time. They do not get increasingly worse in a, in a sliding scale, but they can be erratic and you might find yourself dealing with something that you've never dealt with before. The child here is getting over a reaction. They're going to be okay, but they've obviously had quite a nasty time. A little bit grey around the gills, fat lips there. And if you think that that swelling might have been happening on the inside, you can understand why this is so serious. A bit blotchy as well. Um, many of us are carrying adrenaline auto injectors or epinephrine as it's called in the States. There's the EpiPen and the Jext and the Emirate, the three makes that are available at the minute, I think. Um, it's given in the thigh, it's given in the thigh, nowhere else. You can do it through a layer of clothing. Once you get to that point, you're dealing with a medical emergency, so you're calling 999 if, uh, if you're in the UK at least. And Many of us are asthmatic and we might also be needing help with our breathing from our, um, uh, from our reliever inhaler as well. So dealing with a medical emergency, just a reminder. These are the indicators, anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is basically where you've got two departments in your body kicking off at the same time. So breathing and cardiovascular or gastrointestinal and skin, two departments kicking off anaphylaxis. Difficulty breathing and if the person is faint or floppy because their circulation is failing. And now this is the last slide. Um, that's me. Um, you can see at Allergy Action there. That's my Twitter handle. Um, if you would like to find these slides, I think I've put them on this place on my Allergy Action website. Um, if you have any questions that won't get answered shortly and you want to get in direct contact, then do so via the Allergy Action or hazel at allergyaction.org. And I do put other slides on that page on the website, the third page. So if you want to um, uh, have a look and see what else I've been up to, then you can find them there. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Uh, for a very comprehensive run through. Um, ladies and gentlemen, you'll see a Q&A uh, button at the bottom of your screens. Now is your chance to send in any questions that you might have uh, concerning uh, milk type sensitivity or indeed any of the adjunct issues that Hazel dealt with in her presentation. Um, Hazel, I'm just going to kick off. You, 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 you briefly mentioned vegan, a case where I think somebody ate vegan cheese and they're yes. confused over the actual terminology. Isn't there some debate at the moment with regard to tolerances for animal proteins in vegan foods, um, particularly a dairy protein in vegan foods? One would think that, uh, you know, if you have a milk hypersensitivity, then you're automatically going to assume that vegan foods are actually safe. Isn't that right? Um, well, uh, the trouble is that if you're um, food hypersensitive to milk, um, but you're a teenager or a young adult and you're a bit shy and you don't want to make a fuss, then you might ask for the vegan option um, instead of 
you know declaring your allergy because it's kind of less embarrassing maybe but i don't i don't know of anything about regulating the word vegan i just don't, haven't heard of any rules about that at all but i would like to alert food businesses to the fact that vegan is used as code by some people with food hypersensitivity yes yeah so again i always ask if you have milk hypersensitivity make as many inquiries as you can <coughs> Um, the other question I had was lactose free. You see that a lot on the free from shelves. That doesn't necessarily mean it's suitable for somebody with, with, with a milk allergy though, isn't that right? Not it's at all. No, no, no. It just means that the lactose has been processed. I mean, I showed you a, a box of um, lacto free milk, but it just means that the lactose has been eliminated. I'm not sure how it happens. I'm, I think they might just add some lactase into it. I'm not sure. But the point is that it still contains the casein proteins and the beta lactoglobulin proteins, which are the ones that cause the allergy. So all the allergens are intact and therefore it's still dangerous for the people with the allergies. Yeah, the pro because the protein has not been removed, isn't that right? Indeed, absolutely. And uh, just one more question for me. Uh, you showed fatal UK, I suspected, uh, cases of uh, UK um, or uh, fatal reactions to food allergens in the UK, uh, particularly with regard to milk. Do we do we have any more information on those? I mean, is this is this due to mislabeling or was it cross contamination? What do we know anything? Any other information about those? those well, cases? the ones that I laid out are the most recent, and the thing about those is that we we saw there were two people who died from buttermilk chicken which is a process, you know, marinating the chicken in buttermilk is a, a thing that um, people have been doing in catering for probably the last 10, 12 years, if not historically in their families. Um, and then the thing about the yogurt in the kebab meat was significant as well for, for that reason. Um, so we, I don't think, I, I think what's shocking about these cases is the age of the young adults who, who think that perhaps because the law is now in place to make businesses have to declare the presence of milk, then they can eat out as comfortably and as freely as their friends with, you know, a peanut allergy or a nut allergy. And I don't think that the catering sector has really uh, come to terms with the, with the number of people who might be wanting milk, guaranteed milk parts per million free. And also the fact that milk is a relatively cheap ingredient and it's ubiquitous in many catering environments. So I think we've learned quite a lot from these, particularly that 2017 um, six fatal anaphylaxis cases to cow's milk protein. Some people are allergic to quite a lot of foods and we can't be sure that it was milk. That's it, Apart, in addition to the cases that I've laid out. Um, so there might be others in the unknown that we <clears throat> that we can't be sure about but they might well have been milk i mean you spoke there about that the caterers can't afford to ignore it but i mean the the general consensus is roughly five percent of our populations are lactose intolerance in right. around five percent yeah yeah but on top of that then you've got the other forms of milk hypersensitivity including milk energy and the yeah. different milk intolerances as well so it's quite a quite 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 a lot of people uh, just for the milk hypersensitivity alone yeah. And of course, it's more prevalent in some populations. So in the Chinese population or in the Afro-Caribbean populations, there's, a, there's more uh, lactose intolerance, but it can be in anybody. That's right. Yeah, I think in Southeast Asia, places like Southeast Asia, it's 95% of yeah. the adult population because basically yeah. they lose their, their, their ability to digest lactose yeah. once they... Uh, uh, as I say, in evolution, none of us really needs to, uh, needed to maintain our, our lactase in our gut, but many of us have because we've kept drinking milk generation after generation. But people who haven't, that may be what's happened. That's right. Thanks, Hazel. Okay, folks, uh, any other questions? Uh, send them through now. Or forever hold your peace. Yeah, Hazel, it's not very uh, often you have access to the experts like this, so <laughs> do ask your questions. Hazel has for, uh, given her uh, contact email address anyway, so Hazel, so thanks for that. If you want to get in touch with Hazel directly. Yes, we, we have a question there, um, James. All right. Um, 
it's to do with uh, the use of chopping boards. In a separate chopping board, is a separate chopping board sufficient in a restaurant environment adequate when preparing an allergen free dish? So would you use a separate chopping board? The most important thing is the cleaning. Um, there are um, products on the market where they code, say, allergen cleaning equipment. And so, for example, there's, there's um, purple boards and you can get that for managing all your allergens. But the point is that it's no use managing all the allergens with the same stuff. What you actually want to be sure about is that whatever you're using is clean. Now, you might decide that you'd like a board that you decide you're going to use if you've got, you know, a regular customer who comes in and wants something with no milk. But the most important thing is that it's clean. Um, there has been some work done, and I would strongly recommend that we get some more work done um, looking at how you get stuff clean and whether it is, you know, validating and verifying um, temperatures and cleaning products and surface what you should be using I mean you we do know that a manky old wooden shopping board will will harbor everything um, and you know bugs or whatever so uh, you know the nicest cleanest shiniest um, just come out the dishwasher that's been well um, serviced and use the right product, et cetera, is about the best thing you can do. An extra hot rinse under a tap is probably beneficial, but kind of common sense really. And you certainly don't need to buy special equipment. You need to maintain your routine equipment well. But I think it's, it's fair to say too that just be aware that allergens are protein, so they tend to be sticky. Isn't that right? Indeed. So yes. if you're going to clean something, it's it's hot water and detergent. Isn't that right? To 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 be it sure. Is. Yes, it is. There's a question yes. for Hazel as regarding Have peanut allergy. Ever been able to introduce small amounts of peanut into your diet, Hazel? Well, I haven't bothered, um, mainly because I'm getting a bit old now, and also because I'm seriously I'm finding I've been dealing with this all my life. I'm very good at it. I don't have reactions. Um, I I think if I had a um, a peanut allergic child, I would be seriously looking at uh, engaging with some program of desensitization. Um, but it's it's my allergy. The other thing is that I'm allergic to a whole pile of different tree nuts as well. And the process for um, undergoing desensitization, even if it's done through the healthcare system with real food that's carefully calibrated, etc. Um, it's time consuming, it's expensive, uh, there's a lot of tummy ache and stress on the family and often you have to travel a distance and so on and you have to do that for every single food that you're allergic to and uh, it just depends how, it depends a lot on how stressed you are by having the allergy and how well you can cope with it and as I say from my point of view I've done this a long time um, I'm quite good at avoiding peanuts. I'm kind of now famous for <laughs> avoiding peanuts, if you like. Um, but I wouldn't, I just haven't bothered to go there. But I would really understand why a family would want to undergo this to take, to take this pressure away from their child's life, hopefully forever. We have another question here. If you have an ingredient that you use in a dish that says on the package may contain or prepared in an area, where there may be traces of this allergen. Should you include this on your allergen menu for customers? Well, there's two things there. If you put it in on purpose, you must declare it in the ingredients and you must mention it in the allergen, the 14 allergens. This is the, this is the manifesto. If it's may contain, if it's may contain, that's different because if it's may contain, what I say, you know, there's a sort of a grid you can use, the Food Standards Agency put it out where you have all the allergens going along the top and then you have the dishes down the side. Now you tick if you put that uh, ingredient in on purpose, um, but also I've got a new thing where you put an asterisk if it's come in with may contain. So if you bought it and I don't know, if it's a, a bag of sultanas and it's come in with may contain nuts, then there might not be any other allergen ingredients in the bag of sultanas, but you can put an asterisk under may contain nuts. Now that is not legal, it's not required by law. It's additional information, but it's voluntary information to help the consumer. And then if the consumer then asks, you can say, look, 
there weren't any allergens in this thing, but we've got may contain because of the sultanas. That would be a helpful thing to do. It's voluntary. Yeah, may contain is proving very problematic, particularly for caterers. Indeed. And, and, and they don't know whether or not, should they, how should they treat it? And is it, but it's important to emphasize that there's no legal basis for its use. It's entirely no, voluntary. No, it's entirely voluntary, but it is best practice. And not passing it on, I suppose, puts your business at some risk. On the other hand, I mean, there have been times when people in a not busy restaurant have gone down to the dry store and come back with phone photos of all the labels so that I can choose a dish you know they they got stuff off the boxes um, or they bring me the box it's not very romantic but they'll bring me the couple box and would you like to just read this label and see what you think would you be prepared to eat it but um it is a big dilemma especially the way we're buying food now because we're ordering stuff online we're ordering stuff through apps and so on and they can't really cope with proper may contain saying that there are quite a lot of businesses especially some of the bigger brands that if you declare an allergy, then automatically you can't order on the app. You have to ring them up or you have to go face to face to the business, talk to the member of staff in person, because there's two things. Um, they wouldn't want to put your food into the care of the delivery people in case they might tamper with it. So they can't guarantee the integrity of the food that they're sending out with the delivery company, um, if, particularly if you've got an allergy. And also they um, would like to be able to prepare you something special and make sure that you actually get it. And the delivery company might muddle up the pots or something. So those are the reasons why big brands in particular have, if you declare an allergy, they won't, um, they won't serve you directly. You, have, you can't order like everybody else. That's fine for people like me, but if you were, 16 and all your mates were ordering online for a, a meal or a pizza or something you could understand that you just wouldn't say anything about your allergy because you don't want to be different and it your 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 knee jeopardizes the possibility of eating the food you know for everybody so you might keep quiet which is sadly what happens yeah yeah um i don't think we have any more questions folks um I'm going to bring it to a close there because we're almost at the hour now. Uh, just to say, Hazel, thanks very much again for a uh, very interesting uh, webinar. Um, folks, we're going to send you a link to a survey uh, just to get your feedback on today's event. Uh, we very much appreciate your, your feedback in that regard. Uh, and that's, this gives you an opportunity to, to suggest other topics that you may be interested in having a webinar or maybe even a podcast on. The presentation will be uploaded shortly and the link to the presentation will be sent to you as well. So it just leaves me to say thanks very much for your, uh, to Hazel again and to you ladies and gentlemen for attending today's webinar. I hope you found it beneficial. Okay, thank you.